Oh, hell yeah. Welcome into the Mad Monday podcast brought to you by 4 and 20 Pies, the perfect at home snack for watching the rugby league. Uh, I'm joined by Di Henwood, Tohu Henwood. This afternoon, get a die. How are you getting on, mate? Oh, absolute pleasure to be here. I um had a weekend of just a beautiful weekend yeah. commentating a Warriors win, oh. then slid off to um, Eden Park to watch a bit of Union. Oh yeah, uh, the old Blues getting up over your Crusaders. Yes. Uh, wow, well, the excitement levels are very different between League and Union. And yeah, you mean at the ground? Yeah, well, just like the first half of that Union game was a slow mm. grind. Mm-hmm. Then there was about 10-minute flurry of action after half time. Then nothing really happened. <laughs> and it was a cracking weekend of league. Yes, it was. It's, it's funny you mentioned the difference between, I think, the, the crowds, like particularly at Mount Smart, they're going apeshit from the get-go. There's a real vibe there, but rugby unions just sit there, politely clap when something happens, and then other than that, you don't say anything, you don't really do anything. And it's, yeah, it's just an interesting. So I had a, I had a whole group of dudes behind us who were just barely hanging on to both their sobriety and their mental health, <laughs> just screaming some really horrific things like. Crusaders fans? Um, blues fans, oh, actually. Right. Um, really going deep on Seva Reese's extracurricular activities. Mm. Um, which were bordering on uh, defamation, I felt. <laughs> and um, that difference between uh, Warriors fans have really well thought out, highly um, art-created signs. Yes. They have some good shouts. Uh, the Union fans I found were just pissed and just yelling some really horrific yeah. <laughs> things at each other. It's, it's quite ironic because you think of uh, league as a meathead sport, you know, but the fans are so creative. We are a raquette based fandom, the Warriors. We're also a sign-based fandom. We've got things like the spy wire men. Don't know how I feel about that pun still. doesn't quite fit. No, but what but I love it, it, I dislike the spy wire men pun, <laughs> but the fact that they doubled down and have committed to it for so long. Yeah. It's awesome. It is. Uh, I think one of my favourite things outside of the win has been, you know, I really like to scrub through the Aussie media. Mm. And um, a lot of the Aussie media that then went into the comment section was, wow, man, rugby league fans in New Zealand are pretty feral if you look at that crowd. Yeah. And then all the replies are from Kiwis going, Oh, bro, they're just rural Christchurch people, man. <laughs> they're just people from rural Canterbury, dude. That's just what they're like. Yeah. They happened to be at a rugby league game in this yeah. instance, but trust me, they'll be like this tomorrow. They'll be like this again. Um. Anyway, on to that game. Yeah. We we won outside of Mount Smart in New Zealand. Yeah. We've got like a 37% win ratio. Yeah. And we did it. And, and in front of an incredible crowd. That is the second time in 2024 alone that Christchurch has sold out a Warriors game because, of course, they had the preseason game against the Tigers, which if you're selling out a preseason game against the Tigers, you know, that's a good sign for your Warriors fandom in your region. Because in terms of league, yeah, that's pretty rock bottom. Like, you've got to be a big fan. Preseason Tigers. Tigers. Yeah, it's a, it's a shit show. The crowd was absolutely incredible. Um, we had voicemails coming into the ACC stream from the ground. People sending in, like, they couldn't believe what was going on. You could hear people screaming in the background. People sent in voicemails from uh, the pub. You could hear you screaming in the background over the top of the commentary, <laughs> live from the pub. It's good to see a bit of the groundswell um, following over from last year. But that down there in, in Christchurch, I talked to a few people. I was down in Christchurch on the weekend, but I didn't get to go to the game. Talked to so many people who had been at the game, and they said it was just fucking incredible. I, were you with... Uh G Lane and Shed 22? I was with G Lane at Shed 22, yes. Because you managed to get the ACC comms on we did. the TV. I believe I gave you guys a bit of a shout out. You did. Place went nuts. There was a whole group of people uh, next to us, all in their Warriors kit, watching the game with us. You know, big, like, heated debates when uh, Tua Picky went off. Who do you bring on? How do we reshuffle it? Blah, blah, blah. Um, they were really into it. So that was good. It was, a, it was a bit of a vibe. And also, like, if you're at a pub, you might as well play our coverage. Because, like, no disrespect to the missionary commentary. It's not 
adding anything to the pub environment. So just blast us on, you know. Because at least what I what I um I got some great feedback, yes. which is the best feedback I've had on something I do in a performance realm. Yes. Where someone says that they're not paying any attention, <laughs> they're like, "Hey, bro, we had you you guys on in the background. Um, we couldn't really hear what you're saying because it was a party." But your vibe was there, and that's all that mattered, man. You were just excited. It made the game sound exciting. Yeah. And I was like, bro, that's what we're about. That's right. It completely changed the tone of the bar that we were at because they had like they had a DJ. The DJ stopped. They put the game on, and then they put like house music up. And people were just sort of milling about whatever. When they switched over to our commentary, everybody stopped. They just turned to the TV all of a sudden. And now there was a vibe. There was a try scored. People went nuts. It was it was it was great. We are we're a pub based uh, service, I think, a pub facing service. We need to be uh, in all live venues around the country. The game itself was a bit of a back and forth one. I was sort of nervous up until about like five minutes left to go. Then I was like, Ooh, okay. Hey, how good though? With five minutes left to go, we were in the same situation as we were against Melbourne, up yeah. by eight, and we had. Three or three to five minutes to play. Yeah. And we defended it out. They went for about 22 captain's challenges in that last minute. Yes. Which was just another thing the Aussie media are saying Warriors gifted the game by the bunker. I actually thought the ref had a very forgettable night all around. I think he had an awful night. He had an awful night. This is not saying. He was anti Warriors. No, he stuffed up just a whole lot. There were a lot. There was one where uh, one of the first breakaways we made in the first half, and Rapana held on to. I think it was Jackson Ford who made the break, and he got penalised straight away. And the ref came over and said to Toru Harris, "Yeah, it was foul play. It was foul play." And then Toru Harris goes, "Well, doesn't that mean ten in the bin?" Then he goes, "No, no, just a penalty." And it's like, "Well, hang on." By the way, I love how Tohu just. As a big, he looks a bit of a shambles, but he's so eloquent. His, the way he speaks to the ref and the way he talks in the post-match is so good. Uh, he's the best at communicate, best captain in the league, I reckon, at communicating with the refs. The way, like you said, the way he talks is so clear and concise. He never argues. He's never heated when he goes over there. He'll just be like, hey, you said that it was this, and under the rule book, that means that we should have this. Why isn't that the case? I'll talk to you later on, to- to- <laughs> Hey, did you love, um, I think it was Papali'i talking to the ref and Tohu talking to the ref, where Papali'i goes, we don't, we're not getting any 50-50s. And Tohu goes, bro, we never get any 50-50s. <laughs> no, I didn't hear that one, but that was pretty and, good. And Papali'i had a bit of a laugh about it as well. Yeah. <laughs> now, dialing in on this. Yes. Raiders number one, we were number 14. That doesn't really mean anything because no. it's so up and down in the, ra- in the early rounds. The Raiders came out, they grinded, they played quality football, mm-hmm. and we won. Yes. We should have won by more. There were three tries. Disallowed? Or- For some reason it feels we've learnt so much as a team, mm. but the one thing we've forgotten is the draw and pass. There were about <laughs> that is the first skill that you learn. There were so many of them that you were like, if he just gave that, that one that I was talking about before, Jackson Ford made a break uh, and then... Did he have Metcalf? He had Metcalf, yeah, yeah, on the left. And he looked at him and then just took the tackle. <laughs> which I don't know. But the, also, the Rappiner had committed to Jackson Ford about 10 metres before. Oh yeah. He was locked. And Jackson Ford almost looked at him and got target fixation and then committed to him. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's like up and I was just like, do you take me to be your lawfully yeah. wedded partner? Like, I do. And do you, Jackson Ford? I do. And they were like joined in holy matrimony. Um, I, there were a couple of other ones that it was just like, Adam Fenua Blake got the ball off. Uh, Rocco Berry managed to catch and uh, make a break. And he just picked out the wrong dude. He gave it to Adam Fenua Blake when Metcalf again was right there. It's like, if that goes to Metcalf, even if it goes to AFB and then back to Metcalf, that's I thought, a try too. The one thing that really blew me away is I thought on that if AFB had run straight to the line, he would have got over. But he yeah. ran sideways. How Xavier Savage managed to bring him down? But he almost scragged him as well. I don't know. Like Because he, he pulled him by his jersey. Yes. And I think. He must have elbowed him or kneed him in the rib because 
he then was really ginger. I think, I, I wonder if it was like a bit of a side strain situation because it was such an awkward tackle where he, like but I said, grabbed him by the back of the jersey and pulled him down. No one stops AFB two metres out from the line no. with a ball like that. And I think maybe he was kind of trying to look to give that ball back inside to Metcalf too. Whereas you're right, if in that instance, if he had just committed, he might have made it there. But Metcalf, Metcalf is the number six. He's, he's the playing real deal. so well. That beautiful thing where he's just lurking around. DWZ did the full Walter a little across the pitch, then just popped it up. He was running a beautiful line. Yeah, and there's no substitute for speed, and he has it. He, the, it's no coincidence that all of these breaks that we're talking about, we were like, who was the guy who was just inside? Oh, look, Metcalf. It's because he is that quick, and that that can just really punish people. Like that try that you're saying off the back of DWZ coming across the field. And so the Raiders are just sort of scrubbing across the field as well. Then he just goes dead straight at lightning pace and just went in untouched to score that try. He is completely locked it in. Unfortunately, he's almost doomed to Mighty Martin to a season in the New South Wales Cup. Chanel harris David is a bit more versatile, so um, I think he's going to get a bit more run, as we've seen the last couple of yeah, weeks. Yeah, I really want to see more of Chanel at hooker because, what, he got 10 minutes or 12 minutes? Yeah, and then he kind of had to end up in the centres. Yeah, and he ended up in the centres. Hey, Tain Tuapiki mm. is out. Head knock. For, he's on the mandatory 11-day stand-down. Yes. What, what have been your thoughts on him over the first three rounds? I, th- I thought that Tain tuapiki has been an excellent player for Tain Tuapiki, but he's not probably what the Warriors need. You know, everybody's saying, oh, this guy's awesome. And he is. He beats tackles. He's very elusive. Safe hands, uh, despite the fact that he did run one of the balls uh, out when he caught it. I just thought he's been great for himself and he would be the great icing on a cake for a team that's doing well, but we need Chance back because he's the cog that makes everything work for us. And that's no knock on Tane. No, I completely agree. And because I'm yet to see Tane make an actual line break. Yeah. He always gets halfway through. Yeah. Or he does that, um, which Tedesco can do a lot, where there's a lot of bouncing and stepping and jerking, and you've beaten about three tackles, but you haven't actually gone yeah. forward. It's good stuff for, for super coach points. Oh, completely. <laughs> yeah. And the guy, a lovely gent from the Waz Up podcast, he, if you follow him on Instagram, he mm. does great breakdowns uh, of, oh, yes, of I've seen plays this. Yeah, yeah. where he just calmly talks through. And he was making a good point. Where we miss C and K is when the dummy half or someone makes a break, C and K was always running off their shoulder at full pace, yeah. ready to, to take the draw and pass. Yeah. Taines hasn't really figured out exactly where he should be positionally in the attack. Yeah. Like in the early games, he was missing out on those sweet plays where Chance was. Um, the first sort of either dummy runner or yeah. he'd take the ball. Better at that in this in this weekend's game. Yeah, I and, he, and he fell into that because that first try we got off AFB where Shawnee J just threw the beautiful short ball to him yeah. was perfect. That yeah. was like last year's styles. And, and Tane was out the back of that as well. Yeah, because he was sweeping like it was yeah. going to him. So, I mean, he's not doing a bad job by no, any means. I don't think so at all. But I just think he's he's a, a different, very different player than Chance. You're so right about the um, pushing up with the dummy half because we, Wade Egan was making so many meters around the ruck. If there's only one marker, he's just gone, and he because he knows Chance is going to be right there. So now you've got one marker who's looking at Wade Egan running at him with Chance right on his outside shoulder, and we would often not even go any further than that in a whole set. Like we could get all the way up the field just doing that. And then you do that big sweeping play out the right-hand side. Yeah, and so I think the combination of those two things have, have just been missing for us. And again, I don't mean to say that to say Tane hasn't had a great run of games. I think he has for Tane, but probably not for the Warriors, if, if, if that makes any sense. Yeah, I tell you also who had a great first two games, but a rather forgettable game was Marcelo Montoya, actually, in, in this one. Well, um, He jammed in outrageously fast um, for the Tomoko try, was yeah, it? Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I wouldn't say forgettable because uh, I have the image of him being shaken off, uh, burned into my mind. Uh, Matt Timoko, he 
One is the hardest name for Australian uh, commentators to pronounce for some reason, Tamuku Tamoko. Uh, but he is a brutally tough dude to tackle, um, as is Marcelo, I think, as well. But the way he got tossed off like a, you know, like a little cousin, like a little brother. Especially because hey. he's known for his... For doing that to other people. For doing that to other people. So I think um, what I, I, I'm i wondering about the communication a bit mm. where is falling a bit back on last year when, like, we've got our defensive structures yeah. now and we need to trust our players. We can go back to the Xavier Coates try last week. Mm. What happened there is DWZ didn't really trust his inside man and was hovering in and then chose to go out late rather than the just slow slide across the field. Yeah, right. And it gave Z- Xavier just that extra extra couple of metres to do the unthinkable. Right? Yeah, you peer on top of that at an all-time finish. Oh, <laughs> so that- jumping from five metres out yeah. over a dude yeah. and somehow getting it down. There's no- no- nothing about that that was uh, bad. But I just feel now we've got Roger in the centres mm. and Rocco Berry in the centres. Mm. They are staunch, man. How good's Rocco? <laughs> Rocco's been uh, – he's been excellent. Rocco the Doko has been – Powerful. I mean, he's a big, tall fella. Um, I was sort of saying that he needs to go for maybe like a, a Celtic braid, cornrows, or some, or or a full sleeve tattoo, or something, because everyone else in the team's got a little bit about them. But Rocco's just a god's honest European. So what, what, Rocco, he's Italian, I think. Oh, is right? he? I think that's is where, that where Rocco, Rocco is from. Right. But um, I was thinking maybe he needs to go for full. Um, Either go for the Sons of Anarchy lead dude look. Oh, with the like top knot sort of down the middle situation. Yeah, with sort of top knot and a pointy beard or a sort of Viking buzz. Yeah, yeah. Like he needs he needs his own look, eh? Yeah, big time. That's what he's missing. That'll be the twist on the end of the punch because his game also is very workmanlike. He runs fucking hard. He runs fast. He hits goal, uh, hits holes. He contests kicks and he defends his ass off. I mean, he did come from Rugby Union and you can kind of tell him the way that he plays. How was that stat? That was his 32nd or something, early 30s Rug- game of Rugby League. Of Rugby League. No, sorry, early 30s NRL game. Yeah. And he hasn't played 60 games of Rugby League yet. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> so but- he's played more first grade NRL than, than he, he had than just he ha- rugby league. Yeah, than he hasn't. <laughs> it's it is it's ridiculous. But like you say, you can you can kind of tell. But yeah, he just needs something, something maybe a full roko tamoko. <laughs> <laughs> what I love about him, which is n- something you'd never associate with the Warriors, is how we don't bomb. We like chip to the corner. Yeah. And then he just chases through and tackles. And drills you, yeah. We did it to Xavier Coates and we did it all night to Canberra. Yeah, to Rapana. To Rapana. They have Savage out that way. Yeah. And it must just annoy the other team. Yeah. Because. Because he did drop it too. Yeah, because they go, look, we kicked 10 times to him. He's going to drop it once. Yeah. Otherwise, we just pin them down. Yes, and we're not contesting it because, like, what are the – they must have looked at the percentages. If you're kicking from around the halfway, the odds of you winning that contest are pretty slim. But yeah. But what you can do is get there and drill the guy that catches it, and now every single time they start, they've got 90 metres to go. And the Rapana, who's their big runner, is taking the first hit up. So Yeah. Um, also – how that bro didn't come off with an HIA yeah, in yeah. that game. The HIA one's getting a little bit squirrely now. I feel like they've tried to swing the pendulum back a little bit to letting the boys play a little bit more. But now you're getting guys sickening head clashes, getting smashed, and then not coming off. Oh, when... like the Reese Walsh, yeah, Taylor yeah, yeah. May. How Taylor May didn't go off? Yeah. Yeah, I don't understand it either. But then the... Conversely, and I feel like this always happens to us, but we do have that mindset, but where your player gets hit, he goes for an HIA, but then the other player doesn't go to the bin. So how does that work? Yeah, like that happened with Rapana yeah, yeah. and um, Tane. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because so like, how, how does... Rapana, like he is slowly taking over as a little bit of a grub <laughs> in the NRL. <laughs> he must be a niggly player to play against. Yeah. I think the moustache doesn't really help him. It's quite pesty. 
he has a bit of like a, a Waluigi look about him from Mario Kart. <laughs> you know, he's just got that pissy little mustache. He looks like the evil brother. Oh, he's the Mario Luigi. Yeah, yeah, a little bit. I don't know what it is. It's just a little bit pissy. We're talking about Tain Tuapiki. That's probably one of the biggest stories to come out of this game now going forward because he's going to be out next week. Chance wasn't meant to be coming back next week. They kind of wanted him week five. They said in the presser he was. Th- that he was coming they back? They said, like, <clears throat> the final question in the presser, which, by the way, the pressers, man, yeah. polar, Webby just knows how to talk. Mm, there's he, a reason everyone loves him. He on, uh, honestly answers questions. He's open. Mm. He f- is telling the truth. Whether win or lose, he's good to watch. Ricky Stewart, the second he was there, looked like he was going to punch someone. Yeah. I'm over that whole thing. No, because it's also like, bro, how many of these have you done? Yeah, that's right. Like, after a losing game. Yeah. Surely, and just suck it up, mate. Like, don't, because I hate that thing where a journalist asks, sure, it's a tough question, but you're expecting it. Yeah. Because they have to ask it. And then it's just like they're just so rude to the journos. Yeah. What, what was he supposed to do? Anyway, back to um, Tain Tuapiki. So Webby's saying Chance is going to come back. Yeah, so time. he said, look, Wade Egan is week to week. We'll always name him, but it happens what happens in the yeah. week happens in the week. He said Chan should be back next week. Okay. Well, he's going to have to be now, isn't he? But, I mean, I'd be happy to rest Chan's, put CHT in the centres and um, put RTS at fullback. RTS had a blinder at fullback. Or does Leia Tower step up? I was wondering, do we put CHT at fullback? He played uh, a couple of years ago. I think he played like two games at fullback for us. And he went okay, so I don't know. Like, yeah, but we 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 need wins. Yeah, you're right. You mentioned in the group chat the other day that you think those those first couple of losses could really hold us back come the back end of the season. It's just that <clears throat> those niggly four points. Yeah, and the games we should have won. Now looking at the Knights taking out Melbourne. Yeah, uh, they're going to come with their tails up. Yep. They are a big momentum team. When you look at the table now, the Warriors sit in 11th. The Dolphins and the Tigers are ahead of them who have those two points from their buys. So it's a little misleading. We're probably more like ninth. Um, but you're right. If we had have won one of those two, we're top eight from the start. And I think that is a massive mental barrier, at least for the fans. I don't know if the players give a shit. But also what even sings out is the Storm having a loss, Cronulla having a loss. Oh, bad loss, yeah, too. We'll get into that later on. But, yeah, you're, you're right. I thought uh, some of the other players that got a, that got big raps, I thought Jazz looked great. So did everyone down at Shed 22. Welcome back, Jazz. So did Hurley in the group chat said he thought Jazz looked excellent too. Because Jazz played with aggression, but he didn't overstep the mark. He didn't have any. Uh, he didn't have any uh, bad sort of drops or howlers. No. Um, he's such a good vibe guy for the team. Big vibe guy. What I am liking is how hard it is going to be to get a bench going now because we've got so many people fighting for it. Yeah. I have to say, my favourite bench player was Tom Ali. Yeah. I thought. <clears throat> he made such a difference when he came on. I did too. I just think when we have it available, I don't think Tom Ali makes the bench. And I actually don't, as much as it pains me to say this, uh, I don't think Bunty does either. I think that our bench, when all. You want to go a small bench? I think that we go the Bald Brothers. They have to be on the bench, the two of them. So we're going Dylan Walker, we're going Jazz Tavanga. I think we also go. Marata, have to go Marata off the bench. Oh, of course, I've forgotten Marata, so he's a big body. And then I think we go CHT. So if there's an injury to one of the outside backs, one of the back five, CHT can do that. Injury in the halves, he can do that. Between him and Jazz, we can amalgamate some sort of, you know, the half a well, hooker each. <clears throat> if you look at it, Jazz it was spelling AFB in that game. Yes, he was, yeah. And Which is... It's interesting. It's uh, interesting because... 
He's a lot smaller, but he does. He's doing a lot of that hard work, eh? Walker does it too when he comes on. And I talked to Monty Beetham about this the other day uh, on the podcast. He, I how s- good's Monty? Oh, he's he's the man. Oh, by the way, I bumped into him at the airport on the way down to Wellington. We went to Wellington last Friday, and he was in the airport in Auckland. He goes, "Oh, you're coming down for the game?" I was like, "Oh no, we're off to Wellington." He goes, "Hey," I was like, "Oh yeah, we've got this golf tournament." He's like. <laughs> I was like, oh no, it gets so much worse because we'll be in Christchurch the day after for sailing. He's like, oh man. So I think I'm dead to Monty with him. Anyway, the, my, my point was he said that because I asked him about how we're probably a prop short. We got Mitch Barnett, uh, who was a second row, now he's playing in the middle. But Marata doing the same thing now. And he said, there's more than one way to skin a cat. The point of middle forwards on offense, at least, is to uh, get over the advantage line. Two ways to do that. Smash over them by being stronger or by being faster with uh, greater line speed. And that's what Jazz and Dylan Walker do in the middle. It's what Marata can do. It's it's probably the way that the game is going. With the, You know, we're seeing smaller props. You're Ruben Cotters, you're bloody... Um, Struggling to think of a second example to back up my point, uh, but <laughs> <laughs> but but I just think that you can get away with that. I don't need. I don't know that we need another lumbering prop off the bench, um, and I think unfortunately that that may mean Bunty because then you have your talisman prop like AFB, yeah, who does a bit of both because he's got the late footwork, but he's the battering ram. Yes, you've um, also got Toru. also Mitch Barnett is a weapon. He's a monster. And um, on visually, I thought Capewa didn't have a v- that good a game, but then I rewatched it, and he did a lot. Yeah, he does. He does a lot of that work where you just don't see him, but he's always in the tackle. Yeah, his positional play is really good. I, I I've always thought that about Kurt Capewa, and I sort of think that we might have gotten a little bit excited when we signed him because we we're like Origin second rower. This guy's going to be awesome. Can't wait to see what impact he has. But even when he made Origin, I remember thinking, I don't really remember him doing too much because he's that kind of player. He's never in the wrong position. He doesn't miss tackles. But he's also probably not going to like burst into the backfield out of nowhere. So you're right. I just think there's the things that he does aren't what we expect of a marquee signing. And so we might need to just temper our expectations on, on that end. But I'm I'm with you as well. I feel like there's a lot of people who have just been like, oh, oh Kerp- K- Capewa just hasn't really done anything. We're like, mm. he's there. What I like, <clears throat> what I like about how the Warriors are playing, which is the opposite to Souths, and this is um, something I heard from James Graham, mm. um, listening to him talk, and it was such a good point. He goes, good teams win the game in the first sixty-five minutes then they score their points in the last 15. Mm. So they win the game by just smashing a team, a team trying to go set for set for set, and they just break them down, and then the team's broken at the 65th minute mark, and then you run in three tries. Mm, The Melbourne Storm have always done that. Yeah, where it's just it visually doesn't look like you're winning, but you've just broken them, and then you put on a few flashy plays. Mm. Do you feel like we did that on the weekend? <clears throat> Not so much on the weekend, but I feel that's more the style we're playing. Mm. We're earning our wins. We're yeah. really putting in the hard yards. Whenever I watch an opponent being interviewed before they play the Warriors, first thing they always mention is how tough it is to deal with our forward pack up the middle. That's the first thing that they mention. So it's obviously what they're talking about in training. So you're right, it's, that's probably the, the soften them up sort of approach, and that's what really unlocks that right edge attack. A a great example of that is going into the break when there was that hospital pass to Albert Hopawate and DWZ drilled him. And it's like, it's those moments. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's those moments that you go, oh, you know, DWZ, it's not the flashy put down, it's doing... A huge tackle that lifts your team. He did a couple of those in that game, DWZ. He planted a couple of people. Roger did the same thing, a couple of big shoulders. How good for Rog to get over? Oh, that it was just it was just so good. It was like Roger's back. It was the 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 bar we were at in Wellington just went absolutely ape shit when he did that. I he when you watch it on slow motion, he fended with his wrong arm coming across his body. Yeah. And he 
does I was, I was showing this as like a full training drill to my son. Yeah. He fends the tackler's arm, not the chest. Oh. So he fends the tackler right in like the crook of the elbow so they can't scrag. Yeah. And it puts them right off, whereas most people expect the fend right in the chest. Yeah. He fends sort of in the bicep and the crook of the elbow, and that just puts them off. And it, oh, it's well, just because so, he's, he's also stepping them as well, so they've got to contend with that. Also, he's one of those dudes, I was watching him going, are you stepping left or right? He seems to step both ways at the same time. He's it's, got s- It's terrifying. But that try did come from fullback. Do you think that there's a point in the season where he switches back there? Excuse me. <laughs> oh, my God, that looked like an orgasm. Oh, my God, it was one at the one, yeah. Um, I, nah. No, I don't think so either. I think also we're forgetting how good Chance is yeah. at catching the ball, running it back. Chance and um, RTS, I think they're much of a muchness in terms of returning the ball, positional play. And do- defence. And defence, right? RTS might have slightly silkier footwork. Chance is, but Chance has been with Webby from the beginning – Learning positional play, mm. and it's I I think it we underestimate. We were talking about it before with Tane and with CNK. We underestimate how important Chance's positional play is. Yeah, and also the way he plays. I've always said since he's come back that he kind of reminds me of like a Gutho type player. He's never going to skin you one on one, but he's always in the right position. He's always making the little plays that help us help us win. Um, a couple more quick points that I wanted to touch on before we wrap up the Warriors uh, review. Jack Black in a Warriors jersey, screaming up the wires. Have you seen this? Oh, I've seen it. He nailed it. Is that a huge omen for the Warriors this year? What What I loved about that is Jack Black doesn't know who the Wars are. He nails the intonation, the vibe. Also, it's huge. Yeah. It's huge. This is the... Remember, it used to be, oh, you two or Foo Fighters are playing, oh, come out in All Blacks jersey. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's that one. Yeah. Now it's the Wars. Yeah. And it's a huge omen. It's hopefully a huge omen for the Wars in Vegas. Mm. Um, They're still in the mix. Mm-hmm. I, I saw they just announced the Panthers are going to be the, the Yeah, so round. I think the Panthers are the first home team to be announced like right. in terms of it's a home game for the Panthers. Yeah. Also, I mean, you have to take the Panthers, man. Oh yeah. They've, sure, won, sure. they've won like three. Yeah, yeah. Um so Panthers, Broncos, you probably have to take the Roosters and then us. Yeah. Are they, there's talk of the Dolphins. Ah, nah. Fuck that. Fuck the Dolphins. Yeah. Um they they cancelled sale GP. Why why are we gonna send them to Las Vegas? I reckon. I mean, that's a how I mean, the fact that you missed the excitement of the league to commentate the sale GP that... That was put off by a dolphin. Could we have got Wayne Bennett over there to get the dolphin out of the harbour? <laughs> He's the only one I know that could have done it. Um, and just one more thing that you put into the group chat that I was interested to get um, you to elaborate on. You were saying that potentially, because AFB goes at the end of the year... Yeah, and this I is a big issue. Mm, that's a huge issue. He's so instrumental to everything we do. It's a huge issue on another fact that there are very limited people of AFB's skill level. Mm. You're talking Payne Haas, David Fafida, maybe. uh, Payne Haas is on his skill level. Mm. I reckon. Yes. Then you've got people just under, like Tino Faso Malawi, yeah. Dave Fafida, yeah. um, Joseph Tapane. Yep. Um, I don't mind that. Uh, I I weirdly, I'd take a Tom Hazelton from. <laughs> but yeah, so who do we replace him with? Yeah. Well, it's not Braden Hamlin Welly. So there's talk that Tohu's going to play more prop next year. And play less minutes. He's already playing plenty in the middle. So do we then go for a hard nuts lock? Yeah. 
I'd, I wouldn't mind trying to get Tap in there. Yeah. Joe Taps. I don't mind that. I don't know. I feel like we've got enough second rowers. I do wonder if maybe do we go Marata and Mitch Barnett are our starting props. And between the two of them, we don't have that like and alpha also, beer guy, but we got two. But the, and I mean, there's Zion Ma'u who's coming through. Zion could be the answer. Um, I want to see him get more game time, but he's injured. He looked excellent. In Remember, the there's other big bodies like Dimitrik Sifakula, yeah, who he's out for the season. Don't have a look, uh, Bunty and Tom Bunty Ale. Tom Ale. Yeah. So I mean, I, I think maybe we've got the older heads. Tanner Stowers Smith. Oh, wow. De- dear friend of ours. Dear friend of the podcast. Yeah, I saw him uh, at the game a couple of weeks ago. He came over and said good day. I think he was scratching his nuts directly before he shook my hand. So, Oh, power move. Yeah, well, that is a power move. But, it was also, but well, particularly when I was tucking into a Fritz's wiener, you know. So he was, oh, tu- he was tucking into Tanner's wiener. And that, <laughs> that's my go-to game day snack outside of a 4-20 and Traveller oh, pie. Obviously, I'll go, the, I'll go the 4-20, and but... Um, but if I'm somewhere where they won't have them and I see I show up and Fritz is turning his wieners, so exciting. It's so arousing. Um, but um, so sorry, I, 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 go got, I got my, not that we're sponsored by them, but I got my um, my daughter one um, at, when we went to the rugby. Fritz's wiener? Yeah, get home and she goes to um, my wife, um, Daddy got me a Fritz's wing. <laughs> 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 and I reckon they should call them Fritz's wingers. <laughs> Well, maybe we need to do a collab with 4 and 20. <laughs> <laughs> we come up with Fritz's wangers. Or 4 and 20 wangers. <laughs> <laughs> All right, there's an idea in there. But you said uh, potentially could Cam Murray be someone that we go after? So, look, yeah. This is me. I always watch South. Sun Love South. They're having a shambles. Mm. Cam Murray. Hot dude. Hot dude. What a workhorse. Mm. He's great on a short ball. He can throw a short ball. He does so much work. Imagine if we had Cam Murray at lock. Tohu goes into the middle rotation. Oh, yeah. Now we're talking. Then you've got the old heads of Cam Murray, Tohu, Capewa. Oh, I, could you imagine just the, the short interplay at the line between all of them? Because they can all throw a pass. Then with Wigan. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that would be sick. I like that, that would be epic. I'm a big fan Another of that. signing I'd like, just because I worry about Wigan's longevity, yep. is Jeremy Marshall King. Yeah, Jeremy Marshall King. He plays, he plays, he's a good nine. Yeah, bring him back. He seems like a good God's honest number nine. But then I'm thinking, you know, at the beginning of last year when Webby came in, mm-hmm. Wigan was a bit of a journeyman. Mm. He's turned into a... Oh, they were saying Number ori- one, number nine. They were saying Origin last year. So maybe he turns Freddie Lussack. Well, yeah, th- this is what we were talking about last week on the podcast, is is, is that a signal when they re-signed him? Because we were all saying, oh, Lussack's fine, but you know, I don't think he's going to set the world on fire. But like you say, that's exactly what we said about Wade Egan. So why, why couldn't it be? And if Webby sees something... Then, then I believe. And Webby we trust. And Webby we trust. All right, I think we'll park the uh, the Warriors review for that. It's time for a quick uh, air break. We'll be back to go around the rest of the league. All right, Di, it is now time to get into the stonker of the round. <laughs> there were a couple of options. One of them was actually last night's one between uh, the Melbourne Storm uh, and the Knights. But we've landed on Eels v Eagles, 28-24, this one had all of the drama of a late season game. I thought there were there were massive swings and turns in the fortunes of both teams, and I think the biggest one has to have been the obstruction call against uh, the Eagles, where uh, Gerbo <laughs> obstructed for his brother Turbo, who found a gap. Whether or not the player that was obstructed could have got there. Phil Gould certainly doesn't think so. Did you hear the commentary? Oh, well, he's not even chasing. He's not chasing. He's, he's not, not chasing. chasing. He was never chasing. He was never chasing. <laughs> uh, so, unfortunately, Phil Gould's wrong there. Yeah. The letter of the law is you can't stop in the defensive line. Yeah. And it's not about whether he would have got there. It's about whether he had the opportunity to get there. That's how it's written. Yeah. He didn't have the opportunity even though the defender actually sort of stopped and hugged 
Jerbo. Yeah. Uh, Jerbo a... made a mistake. He knew he made a mistake. The reason why the law, we go by the letter of the law, is just because it's the letter of the law. It's yeah. not a vibe thing anymore. I fully understand he wouldn't have made it. But it's not really our judgment call to, to, to say because you don't know. No, so the bunker goes, right, what does the law say? Yeah. The defender can't stop in the defensive line refusing an opportunity to the defender. Yeah. What did Jerbo do? He stopped in the defensive line refusing an opportunity. Yeah, because it happened in the Bulldogs game as well. They got they had a try denied and it was like Matt Burton standing in the way of a defender who would never have got a hand to him. But it's like, again, this is the rule. It's the way the rule was written. It's the way we're going to have to enforce it. I saw it. Sorry to go back to the Warriors, but we had a bizarre one when Jackson Ford played the ball, but he wasn't on balance. So weirdly, that that was the letter of the law as well. Yeah. They brought it in last year. You can't plant, put the ball down and push yourself up with it, which is what he did. Yeah, but Even he didn't though, lose balance. No, th- this is what I couldn't understand. He played the ball fully. And then fell over. Then fell over. So I thought he was a bit hard done by. Yeah, that should have been a vibe. Because I think the ball plant rules only when you have a real wobbly play of the ball. And it's because players were doing that so that they would knock it on and then they'd try and get the penalty. So it's yeah. like you're trying to fleece the referee. Or there. they do it where they just try and play the ball so fast. Yeah. Um, to try but, and make it look <clears> like the opponent's obstructing them. Yeah, I I mean, I thought that it could have gone either way, but that was the letter of the law. I also thought... Manly started off so beautiful. I feel so happy for Luke Brooks that he's playing great footy. Uh, he looks like he's enjoying life. He just looks like a guy who's quit a shitty job and he's back at the pub having a beer with you, having a laugh, watching the footy. Or a guy who's just left his missus who you knew that they weren't quite right for each other but you didn't even want to say it, you know. And, actually- the, and he's also in the glory period just before he fully fucks his life up. <laughs> yeah, he's in, that, <laughs> he's in that purple patch. He's absolutely run through the the, through the the, uh, the Tinder options available to him. Oh yeah, no, he's freshly freshly into Tinder. Yeah, yeah. Where yeah. it's like, oh, this is good. What? I'm yeah. not going out. People, I'm sleeping with people. Yeah, it's not it's not where he's just got to the bottom of the barrel. Yeah, he started. He's he's got too many people on the go. It's getting messy. Also, I'm really horny for Combank Stadium. It, oh, we need to get over there. Dude, it looks so good to watch a game just raked right down, mm. right down to the sideline. Yeah. Um, and in a weekend, you could watch two different games there. I love it because my, my son's, um, he ball boys for the MPC, right? Oh, and yeah. He's almost getting the call up for the Blues. Ooh. But um, <laughs> I love this little career, ball boy career. So he... So he's like giving me insight. I was like, oh, I love Combank Stadium. And he's like, oh, mate, I feel for the ball, boys. Absolute <laughs> nightmare. And I was like, why is that? He's, oh, just when you got those real close sidelines, every kick goes in to the crowd. And then let me tell you, when you're an 11-year-old trying to get the ball back. <laughs> <laughs> and I love it. It's like this deep, like, oh, that ground be a nightmare to ball boy <laughs> Uh, it's such good insight, eh? Yeah. Stuff that you wouldn't think of. So, He's well. just like, oh, just trying to get the ball back out of the crowd. <laughs> <laughs> but it looks so great. There are two teams that play great footy. Yeah. Tommy Turbo's back in form. How good's Ruben Garrick? Ruben Garrick's excellent. He's beautiful. He's handsome. He kicks goals. Uh, yeah, there's what's not to like. There was a clip of him lining up a goal, uh, I think from last weekend, and there was a, a group of like four girls sitting in the front row and they were all just giggling and blushing as he's lining up his kick. <laughs> oh, because he's got the sexy scar. Chicks dig scars. Oh. Chicks dig scars. He's a hot dude. He's a great footy player. They have a good team. They are not as turbo dependent as they have been, and I think they've kind of had to become that because he's been out so much. What I really enjoyed is like I – I wasn't like always looking for, okay, where's Turbo? That's where it's going. That's right. It was like, oh, no, they actually set Turbo up as a decoy on an open side, then they'll run a nice little short side play. Is there anything more terrifying in rugby league than being a half, defending against the Manly Seagulls, and they are running at you with Olakawatu and then Turbo out the back? Olakawatu is just... A beast of a player. Oh, I feel Manly are one 
player, one big dude short. You mean like a forward? Yeah. Like a yeah, they got Oshay Ole. Just just because it feels like Ola Kawatu is like you know he's doing the one barnstormer. Don't they have to tough for Sipley as Tough well? Sipley, yeah, he's been coming off the bench then. Uh, they got Paseca, <coughs> who's an absolute monster. Oh too. yeah, no, he's sorry, they've got some big dudes. Yeah, they actually do. Yeah, <laughs> so when you run through it, yeah, but, Schuster's still yet to come back, but I don't know what's going to happen there. Um, I watched his him in reserve grade. Yeah, uh, yeah. he's got a lot. He's oh. get, the thing is. I really feel for Schuster because I wonder what's rattling around in his mind because I, he feel I, I feel like the 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 only part of his game that's missing is the mental game now. Big like time. he doesn't have that grind of how some players they get sent back to reserve grade. Well, I suppose he's going through it now, but yeah, they get sent back to reserve grade and all they do, like for instance, Lock Lachlan Elias, right? Yeah, he he. Destroyed in reserve grade on the weekend. Yeah, like Just told them I'm not supposed to be here. Yeah, like we the, where they take it as a personal affront. Yeah, and they're like, nah. Yeah, um, you're right. He doesn't quite have that. I do think what a big part of it is is he was playing had a breakout season in the second row, was throwing all these scucky passes. He said, I want to be the number six, and the club said, okay, we'll sack club legend Kieran Foran, and you can play number six next year. Now that can so easily go to a player's head. And I do wonder if that's a little bit of what's happened. So then he's gone, well, I'm not going to drop 20 kilos to come back and play at number six because you guys have just sacked the club legend for me. So I'm obviously that good, you know, and I wonder well, if... The, the one thing that I think about so often when I hear about these dudes coming back mm. overweight and, and also struggling to make weight is I'm like, I spend my whole bloody life watching what I eat. Oh, I'm going to go keto, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. I go, if I was literally paid hundreds of thousands of dollars and I had nutritionist, uh, full, like multiple coaches, I would be shredded, bro. Oh. <laughs> I'd be out of my mind. You yeah. know, like it's the thing of going, the reason why I can't get exactly what I want is because I do meal prep for a bit, then I can't be fucked. Yeah. Yes, same. Whereas these dudes, That's right. they've got people meal prepping. Yeah, because my mate shows up on a Wednesday. He goes, oh, should we go get a burger and a beer down at the pub? I'm like, yeah, okay. Cause... And you've gone, oh, I nailed Monday and Tuesday. Yeah. Fuck it. Because I can still show up to work tomorrow and do just fine. Yeah. But whereas the difference is that's his entire job. No, and that's so that's point. why when I see these guys, I'm like, you're literally being paid hundreds of thousands of dollars to be in shape. What's the barrier here for you? And then you see the other dudes, like, look at the Warriors, man. They're just shredded. Ah. And the Dragons are the same. See, they lost on average 10 kgs a player or something. Is that right? Yeah, they lost 170 kgs in the offseason. Wow, it was. They um, have looked better this year, too. Shane Flanagan just rode them. Although, what? they were up by 18 points, oh, right. and then they led in 42 unanswered points. Yeah, look. There's it's, a bit of that. There's a bit of that. There's a bit of that. You do get hungry. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, that was the stonker of the round. Eels 28 uh, over the Eagles 24. Uh, I think whenever one of those games sort of goes down like that, as soon as that obstruction call happens, the ref goes, please don't lose by one try. That's exactly what happens. Yeah. So it was always going to be a headline. All right, we're going to go to one more ad break. We're going to get back to talk about the Tigers of all teams. So the Tigers, Di Henwood, Beat the Cronulla Sutherland Shire Sharks 32 points to six. Upset of the round for sure. Um, do we put a line through the Sharks? <laughs> what I love is like, I was sort of like, oh, the Sharks will be maybe going into the top eight. Watch their first two rounds. Oh, they're a top four side. Yeah. Then watch this. So everything that could go wrong for them did. Right. Was it Hamlin Ueli? No, Royce Hunt. Yes. Right? Who's starting for them at the moment? No, bro. Royce Hunt was starting for them off the bench. Right. The game started, and then he ripped his calf on the sideline. <laughs> so they were already a, 
prop forward down. Well, you, you talk about the Dragons losing 170 kilos. Uh, I think that Royce Hunt probably subscribes to the Schuster school of yeah. weight loss. So he was doing the, you know how they like jump, do the high knee jumps. He was doing that and he tore his car. Oh, Jesus. So they were already, they were down to 16 players before he had come on. He was just warming up to come on. Yeah, that's why I'm in um, Hazel. Hazelton. Hazelton got a, um, got a quite a good super coach score as well. Oh, yeah. He comes on. He runs hard. Um, so this was played at Leichhardt, which is both the best and the worst ground in the NRL. How so? Apparently it's an absolute nightmare. To get to? To be at. Right. Because it's like one chip caravan. It's a whole bank. It's, it's like a forest at one end. Yeah, it's like you, you, you sort of can fit between four and 7,000 people in. Like, yeah, right. So, and they're going to bin it after <clears throat> next year, though, so. Yeah, but it's a talisman ground. Once you're in there, it's a real old school feel. Yeah. It had a cool vibe to it. There were so many people on that bank. And the Tigers did what Benji Marshall asked. He said, I just want you to play to the game plan for 80 minutes. Yeah, win or lose. And they did that. Um, Epi Corosau could not walk before the game with a gastro bug. Really? You saw him actually puke in the end goal at one point yeah, after yeah. he dove for a try. And he had the game of his life. He threw one of the best no-look short balls Ugh. where he looked like he was going to throw this epically long pass and then he just hit Seyfarth on a short ball. It was magic to watch. Yeah. Imagine him at number nine if we can imagine. And well, well, Warriors jersey. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I've just traded him in on my super coach team because I wanted to be in on Uppy, but they had that first round bye. And I also just don't believe in the Tigers. But – all of a sudden, if you look down, I, I wrote a, I wrote a few of their uh, uh, acquisitions over the last two years. All of a sudden, they've picked up Appy Buller, who I think came through the age grade there, but you know, it's just coming to first grade last year. Olam, Galvin seems to be a find. Lachlan Galvin, Papali'i, Aiden Caesar. All of a sudden, what Papali'i? Oh, aside Papali'i, Papali yeah, yeah. Um, so aside Papali'i had a reasonable forgetful year last year, not because of him, because of the Tigers and mm, everything. Mm, yeah. Completely agree with you. Buller is Buller. going to – Jareem Buller Buller <laughs> is going to be a superstar, man. Yeah. When he just yeah. dials in all his positional play and defensive stuff, yeah. he's amazing on attack. Olam – Olam is Olam. Olam wound back the clock to his um, – Full Melbourne storm form. Full Kummel's form. Shit, I would hate to tackle that dude. No. Or be tackled. He's just, you know those guys who aren't big, but he's all limbs and he it's, just hurts. It's a raw bones motherfucker, yeah. And, um, degree in theoretical physics, I think. Up he, uh, sorry, Justin Ollum. He's got a degree in some sort of thing. Let me Google that. That one. is phenomenal. Yeah. Also, I'm not fully sold on his... Um, Braids. I'm out on the braids. He's just, you know, like like this is coming from a Pakeha perspective, right? <laughs> yeah. The one thing I'm always jealous of um, my brown brothers <laughs> is being able to pull off some good hairstyles. Yeah, yep. Braids, cornrows, it generally looks good. It doesn't on Justin Ollum. I don't know what it is. I he can't. looked like a white guy who had gone for braids. Yes, yeah. Like it just set the way braids do on a white guy. It's the haircut I would like Rocco Berry to try. <laughs> <laughs> oh, like, grow it out, go to Fiji and go to Kids Club Rocco and get yeah, your hair braided that's at Denira, my is. man. Uh, he has graduated from Papua New Guinea University of Technology with a bachelor's degree in applied physics. What a legend. And and he's been in the NRL applying some motherfucking physics to dudes. Bro, well, he is works out the hypotenuse on how to smash <laughs> a dude, and he nails it. Um, yeah. Galvin. Yes. How Galvin, cool uh, How cool that um, Benji just went, let's give the, give the reins to the young man. Yeah. Give him the jersey, and he stepped up. That's what happened he to, looks great. That's what happened to Benji in 2005. Yeah. Then you've got the old head of... Caesar, yeah, was it? What do you call that? Was it Talis Duncan? Was he the guy who was playing? Because there was one dude who debuted and then disappeared. No, he debuted on the weekend for the Tigers, and he was born the day the Tigers won the 
Oh, really? The premiership in 2005. I don't know. It could have been Tellus Duncan. I don't know. Yeah, it's, I have to look yet. that up, but it was one of those just – what I – full respect, f- the Fox coverage, they go like cricket geek on some stats. Yeah. Where you go, how did you even get that? Yeah. Well, that's where I got the Justin Ollum one <laughs> from, that he had the that he had the degree. Uh, one of the funniest things about this, though, the – it's become a thing recently, I was talking about this on the Agenda podcast this morning, the winning team song is something that's sort of, I know that teams have had them, but it's really taken off in the last few years, I think because of social media, they've been posting them. Tigers you know, haven't had a lot of opportunities to practice their winning song, so a lot of the players didn't know the words to it. And so Benji Marshall and Robbie Farrah got together and said, well, fuck, should we just write a new one then? And so they did. Benji Marshall and Robbie Farrah wrote a new winning song for the Tigers. So new that none of the players had ever seen it. Well, they had never sung it. So they had to print it out on a piece of paper like this. And there's videos in the sheds. I won't play the audio because it sounds atrocious. Of the players all crowded around. Adam Dewey's standing there in a suit holding one of the, like, hymn sheets. And they're all sitting Oh, he's tr- yet to come back. He's yet to come back. I don't know when he'll be back. Oh, I think he's next season. Yeah, but he's so amazing. Um, but they're all sitting there singing this new team, sh- team song. <laughs> How do you think Benji Marshall goes as a lyricist? And to be honest, he goes better than Robbie Ferrer, I reckon. <laughs> <laughs> Although, look, Benji Marshall, you've got a bit of, um, bit of Pacifica Lebanese buzz going on. Yeah. Oh, that's a combo. I can imagine Benji Marshall freestyling on the streets of the of Fakatani outside the Kopi Fish and Chip Shop, maybe. Just oh, you've got a bit of hungy Turkish delight <laughs> happening. <laughs> I, I love it. I thought that was quite interesting. So, yeah, uh, Tigers batting Sharks was a revelation across the weekend. A couple more points before we knock this thing on the head, die. Uh, Tino, unfortunately, did his ACL this weekend. I hate that, to see it. That is going to be him for 2024. I hate to see it. Look, I'm a massive New South Wales fan. mm Tino's one of the better Queensland players, but I hate to see it. Yeah. You want to see all the best players on the park. I feel for the Titans, there's still David Fafita's still out for a bit. They've still got Mo Fodawaka who's doing great stuff. Tino Fasua Malawi is quite a talisman. He's the captain. He's out for the season. He's a captain. He looks like a bloody good dude. I feel for him, but... The Titans are out, man. Put a line through the tits. They're bottom four. Yep. Uh, and it doesn't help with your super coach either because it's a front row wasteland. Out I there at don't. The I don't have a gun. I'm. Or, or, I've there got, are none. I'm half. I'm Ruben Cotter and Flegler. Yeah, I think that's basically where. And most then like a Morgan be. Smithies, Sam, Samuel Ufanu or something. Yeah, uh, Viliami Fafita. Yeah, you know those dudes like Viliami Fafita and uh, Kane Bradley who played last <laughs> yeah, night. Yeah. You know when those guys come on, you go, hey, he's in my super coach team. I have no idea what that dude looks like. He could have walked into <laughs> yeah. this room right now, I wouldn't have known. Yeah, so that, that is pretty tough for the super coach as well. And just finally, the last point to touch on, I wanted to get your thoughts on South Sydney. They lose again on the weekend. Uh, they are yet to win. They are one of two teams that haven't won yet. They have lost three games in a row. What's going wrong? Uh, are they done? Is it? Is it, does Russell Crowe need to fire Jason Demetrio? No, How does well, this... the opposite's happening. Russell Crowe's come out hardcore behind JD. Yeah. Um, the issues stemmed from after round 11, they were top of the table last year, and then they didn't make the finals. They've only won a few games That's since. That's incredible. They've only run a few. It's the first team ever to be leading the comp yeah. in round 11 and then not make the finals. So since then, they've only won a handful of games. They're missing some stocks and Jai Arrow, Campbell Graham, who are big losses. Mm-hmm. Um, Jack Whiten was, well, I wouldn't say back, but in for them. Yeah, he's, in, he's up in the judiciary again. He killed for, Sam Walker. <laughs> for using his um, bumpers and his elbows and a knee, I think. Um, the, now, Sam Burgess walked out of the club because yeah. he said, some people were getting preferential treatment that he didn't approve of. He was talking about Cody Walker and Luttrell. Oh. However, Gordon Tallis has come out and went, that's just what people get. Good players get that. Like No he, one would have had more than Sam Burgess. No, and Gordon Tallis was saying he was at training at the Broncos when he was playing with a great Steve Renouf, mm. Renouf, Renouf. 
For an elf? And um, training's half done and Renouf goes to Wayne Bennett. Just off to get a coffee, Wayne. Uh, have a good rest of the afternoon. Yeah. And he walks off. Yeah. And Gordon Tallis goes up to Wayne and goes, how come, how come Steve's, Renouf's just not training with us? And he goes, mate, when you can do half the things he can do, you can go for a coffee with him. I've heard the ex- <laughs> I've heard the same story about Justin Hodges back in the day. Too. Yeah, just so, like all right. Well, if you can fucking yeah, if you could do it, <laughs> yeah. So that's so that's the thing is they do get and Latrell man is a free spirit of a dude. It's yeah. like right, mm. he likes being on his farm in Tari. Mm-hmm. He likes being with his Fano. He needs that time. Yeah. It's very important to him. And people, I mean. Unfortunately, the Aussie, Australia's, everyone over here is aware of Australia's approach to race relations. Unfortunately, the fact that Cody Walker and um, Latrell mm. are native Australian. Uh, that, that leader's emerging. Uh, they're Aboriginal leaders, yeah. really. And the amount that they do for Indigenous yeah rights and indigenous um, within the game is huge. They get unwarranted shit thrown on them. Fuck yeah. Latrell's actually had his best start to uh, um, best start to a season in 10 years. Yeah. Stats wise. And Cody's trying his ass off. There's more issues there. They need to um, they need to play hardcore football. Mm. They're chucking it around a bit too much. They're getting loose. They're trying to score off everything. I kind of have always looked at them as like a, a glass cannon of a team. With that, and I think the Knights are actually of last year were a little bit like this too. They could hang fifty on you. They could equally concede fifty, and you just don't know which one it's going to be. They're almost like the Bears ball of rugby league. And, yeah, and the the. Rabbitohs in particular have always been there, you know. But they they can put massive scores on. And it's dudes. almost like if they chuck it around early and the passes stick and they get a couple of quick tries, you're in deep shit. Then they they've got the Midas touch. Then yeah. everything sticks. Latrell flo- Cody throws a like loopy ball. Latrell grabs it with one arm. Yeah. They're just in. They go razzle dazzle. Yeah, and but then. You play like they did against um, the Roosters, and the Roosters were in for the grind, man. Yeah, and I think that's – and you say that you want them to play a bit more like hard-nosed, just good God's honest footy, get through their sets, blah, blah, blah. That is what the key to the success for the Warriors has been, is that we used to be that razzle-dazzle, run it out of anywhere like the Fijian Drua, where now we're like complete our sets, punish you, and then we're going to kill you in that right-hand corner. And – I think you're bang on. That's probably a little bit of what they're missing to start this season, isn't it? And they've got the weapons there. Totola and Keon Kolomatangi yeah. are epic players, dude. Yeah. Burgess is having – yeah, he makes a difference. So I wouldn't put the line through them, but they have – like they have – They've looked – Three and oh is rough. They have to win. Crusaders territory. Yeah, they have to win. They haven't quite got to five and oh. No. Now, look, before we wrap this up, this isn't even about league, but if you're a meth head mm-hmm. out there, Shout out to can you. you just put some effort into we across the road? Like, the etiquette of meth heads crossing the road is really outrageous. Like, go to the lights, bro. Yeah. Go to pedestrian crossing. I feel like something you've had an experience. Oh, I've had, I had my car whacked twice by two meth heads in the last week who are just giving me shit for driving 30 k's in a 50 zone. And they're just whacking my car, mate, wandering across the road, carrying way too many things. Also, when you're not even, when you're not crossing the road, each bag has a different thing, right? If you've got a thin single-use plastic bag, don't try and hold something really heavy and spiky in it, man. Get yourself a different bag. Get a tote bag, fabric. Look, tote bags, they're out there. They're not costing money. People will hook you up with a tote bag. You could steal some from the supermarket, surely. 
Oh, de- well, I mean, most of them have gone to the effort to steal a trolley from the supermarket. Yeah, that's right. So surely they could just go a tote bag. Take a tote bag. Why, what, Spikey, they have a kinner in a plastic bag or something? Oh, you multiple kinner. <laughs> multiple undersized kinner. And kinner. let me tell you, multiple undersized kinner that have been in the hot Avondale sun for a week, they're not good for consumption. <laughs> All right, we'll knock it on the head for this week. Shout out to the meth community. Um, (laughs) Like and subscribe, and uh, we'll see you later on this week for another episode of Mad Monday. An Australia without rugby league is not Australia.